Good afternoon. I'm Jana Martin, Chief Executive Officer of the American Insurance Trust, known to most of you simply as the Trust. We are delighted that you're able to join us virtually today for the third webinar in our new virtual webinar series. The Trust is pleased to be able to offer this type of informative content free of charge to our policyholders. Make sure you block time in your schedule for our next Risk Management Roundtable on Thursday, May 7th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time and our Telehealth Community Chat number two on Monday, May 11th at 5 p.m. Eastern. I also want to remind you of the COVID-19 resources page where you'll find resources created by the Trust and our partners. We just posted a new six page frequently asked questions document that was prepared by our knowledgeable risk managers that you may find helpful. You can find a link to this page as well as the virtual webinar series page on the important information slide. Here at the Trust, we live by our motto, for psychologists, by psychologists. It resonates in everything we do, and we pride ourselves on being able to support the profession of psychology in ways no one else can. Most of you are likely familiar with our risk management consultation service, the Advocate 800 program. It's one of the many benefits our policyholders receive through the trust. Three of our advocates are with us today. Doctors Daniel Taub, Eric Harris, and Liesl Bryant. In the interest of time, we've placed their bios on a slide for you. Before they begin the presentation, I have a few additional things to tell you. First, we hope this will go just as smoothly as our previous virtual webinars, but should there be a technical problem, please bear with us. We'll do our best to keep things moving. If you do happen to run into any issues that you're unable to resolve after using the instructions provided at registration, contact our Customer Service Center at 1-800-477-1200. Or send an email to seminars at trustinsurance.com. As this is an interactive webinar, we will be taking questions from participants. You'll find the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen that you'll click on to type in your question. Our team will do their best to answer as many questions as possible. Unfortunately, as is true in most presentations, we likely will not get to all of them. This virtual webinar will earn you one CE credit. This can be combined with five other risk management credits to save up to 15% on your trust-sponsored professional liability insurance policy. We'll post the exam link in the chat box at the end of this presentation. We'll also provide a slide with exam and certificate instructions that you can screen capture for reference. Please remember to submit your CE certificates with your policy renewal. Again, I hope everyone learns a lot over the next hour. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed presenters. Great, thanks, Jana. And we are thrilled to be here with you today. As Jana said, we are gonna to try to get through as many of your questions as possible. Um, and Dan and Eric are gonna be answering as succinctly as we can, while also trying to make sure to give you enough information. I do wanna just note, and no doubt Dan and, and um, Eric will mention this as well when it comes up, there will be times where there's state-specific information that you may need to fully answer your question. And we won't be able to go into that level of detail here, um, but we will try to note when that kind of information is needed. And of course, you guys are all welcome to give us a call at the um, Advocate Risk Management line. So if you, if you either don't get your question answered today, or if you feel like you need additional information based on something we said, just give us a call and set up an appointment and we'll be able to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one. okay? So with that, we're going to go ahead and get going. And the very first question we're going to start off with, Eric, I'll, I'll direct this to you first. 
Um, the question is, what are the actual risks of providing teletherapy services to someone who has been displaced by the COVID-19 pandemic and is now in a state where their provider is not licensed? Garrett? Thanks, Liesl. So this is going to be, as Liesl said, simplified because it's more, much more complex than I'm going to be able to describe here. But again, it's always good to give a call if you have more questions that this doesn't answer. Now, state licensing boards have taken the position that a telepsychological transaction or meeting takes place where the recipient of the service is, which technically means that if you are licensed in Massachusetts and you're providing services to someone who was in college there but is now returned to California, according to the licensing board, you're practicing in California, and unless you are in compliance with their temporary practice rules in providing those services, you're deemed to be practicing psychology without a license. Practicing psychology without a license is a criminal offense, and therefore is not something that obviously is advisable. However, um, the courts have not really upheld the jurisdiction of California and other states to be able to assert um, jurisdiction over people who are doing nothing more than merely extending services to someone who has a good reason for getting them and who needs them um, in, in order to uh, accomplish some goal. Um, I should say that um, every state has some temporary practice rules. And if you're interested in finding the temporary practice rules, you can go to the ASPPB, that's the American Society, State and the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards. They are updating their uh, website uh, on a regular basis. It has what the state law is and also whether there's been any special proclamations or rules issued by the government to deal with the COVID-19 situation. Um, so uh, in our belief it, that if you saw someone in this situation, let's say just for the situation I raised, and um, you would first need to decide whether or not it's appropriate to provide them with telepsychological services. And that would require you to look at the alternatives. Um, is there somebody that you can refer them to in California? Uh, what is your, how much are you going to extend services to them? Are you only going to extend to them the services you need to transition them to a referral? And that will of course depend on whether they're going to come back to school, when they're gonna come back to school, and whether you will be there to resume therapy when they come back to school. Many people at college counseling centers will not be there next September when people come back. And in those cases, just providing enough services to get an appropriate referral makes the most sense. Um, it, what we are basically saying is if you have a client who has been suddenly displaced by the COVID-19 ep epidemic and you extend services to them, the chance of any negative disciplinary consequence is very close to zero. You can't say that it's impossible. Um, but in addition to the case law, which says that they can't assert jurisdiction, it would also be very difficult for a California to bring any kind of disciplinary action against somebody in Massachusetts whose only contact with California is providing these necessary services under COVID-19. In addition, even if they wanted to do that and thought that they could get away with it, then they would not be able to um, convince anybody above them to make the time and energy necessary um, to actually bring a criminal complaint, which would require extradition. Um, and most likely, the worst case that someone would experience in that situation is a, a cease and desist order, which is not discipline. Um, and we, this is not only our position, uh, representatives of the ASPPB have agreed with this interpretation at workshops that we've given and in an article that they wrote along with Jana and I uh, about interjurisdictional inter practice when the guidelines for, came out. Now, 
What I want to say, though, is if you're going to do this, it is possible that you will get a complaint in your home jurisdiction. And if you get a complaint in your home jurisdiction, it's very important that you follow the three most important principles of the trust risk management system. The most important in this situation is documentation. You want to document everything you thought of and rejected and accepted in making the decision that this was something that made sense for you to do. Because if anybody looks, that's what they're going to be looking for. And the important thing in the documentation that you want to provide is that there was no other reasonable alternative that was as good as your extending services remotely um, that you could find. And that the patient was, in fact, uh, appropriate for the service, uh, that you were able to give them good informed consent, which, by the way, is the second element of important element of our risk management strategy. And um, I'm forgetting the third one. Consultation. Consultation. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. You're I'm welcome. Getting old. But can I tell you? <laughs> um, the consultation is really important because it shows that you are, it's very possible in a very difficult situation that your judgment may be slightly impaired. I don't mean impairment in a negative sense, but with everything going on, it's always a good idea to check with somebody else to make sure that your thinking makes sense. And if you record the consultation you have and they agree with you, or even if they don't agree with you completely, you also increase the possibility that everybody will see you as having practiced appropriately. That's my answer. Okay. Great. Dan, do you want to add anything there? No, Eric, I think you covered it succinctly and well. Um, the nutshell is not very likely to have any discipline, particularly in COVID. And I'll just, a very quick follow-up to that. Um, does the calculus or risk change at all if, the, if this is a new patient, if it's not one that you've been doing, so there's not a continuity of care piece, but now someone calls you from another state and just wants to start a treatment relationship with you? And that's, that is a different situation and, re, and would really require a more complex answer. Um, let, if they called you because they offered some special service that wasn't available where you are, you might be able to do that and get away with it without much risk. But if they just called you and said, I'm in another state and I would like you to do service, I just saw your web, saw your ad on psychology today, that would be more dangerous. Although I don't think it would be very dangerous because of the things I've said about how difficult it would be for another state to actually come after you. But we wouldn't recommend that without a very thorough consultation. And we would need to be convinced that what you were doing was so essential to what the person needed that, that, that it made sense to do it. It wasn't that it was superior in many ways to a in-person referral in that state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, all right, thanks, Eric. So moving on to another question then. The question is, I'm very concerned about the potential risks and liabilities for returning to in-person meetings with my clients. What factors do I need to consider in this regard? What are the risks to me, to my client, and others? And what should I do to minimize those risks? Dan, we'll start with you on this. Sure. First, thank you everybody for joining us today. And this is a question that we as risk managers, right, Eric and Lisa, we've been getting this question, particularly the past week and a half or so. You know, part of it is that the, the rapidly evolving nature of the situation and the impact of COVID-19 makes conclusions about this relatively tentative, all right? We are not requiring you, we are not required to be virologists or physicians, but if public understandings grow, for, for example, about things such as the heightened risk of people who are pre-symptomatic, um, psychologists are going to be expected to know what the public generally would know. And we're gonna be held to a standard of care that says, what would a reasonable practitioner in a similar situation have known or should have known, and how would they have acted? And if we fall below that standard, that's when liability is gonna be a concern. I guess the major issue in my view is um, those psychological services are very important to people. 
we have to balance that against the risk of contracting a potentially fatal disease. So we are, as a team, recommending extraordinary caution as you return to in-person services. The hurdle is going to be high. Now, this is going to be echoing to some extent what Eric was just talking with you, us all about in terms of steps, but there are kind of five prefatory um, steps to, to get ready to consider and to go through the process of engaging in in-person services. Clearly, you got to consult about this and document the consultation. Do a very explicit ethical analysis and risk analysis. And the ethical analysis is, what are the principles involved here? Do no harm, minimize harm, con continuity of care on the one hand, and then also, what are the potential risks to you, to your family, to your patients, to their families, and to your staff? The third is articulate your reasoning and your conclusions well. Be able to justify why you're beginning now to go back to in-person services. And Eric mentioned as his first, uh, as one of his points, doing a good informed consent process, what, um, what we would strongly urge and what we're working on is an addendum to your informed consent that would basically do a special focus on the risks as well as benefits of in-person versus remote care. Um, please be aware though, simply advising a, a, a patient that these are the risks isn't going to mean that we'll avoid the standard of care if somebody comes back later and says, well, Dan, you should have never seen them in person. They've gotten sick and I don't, and they know about the risks, but I go ahead and do it despite all of these risks. So we may still have a fair amount of responsibility. And not surprisingly, and what Eric started with was documentation. Careful documentation of all of these steps is going to be very important. So getting down more to specifics, digging in a little bit about what kind of considerations the, the, the question uh, asked about, there are gonna be at least six or seven, maybe even eight considerations. One of them is, does your, is your state still, or has your state actually been in a state of emergency? Are there shelter in place, SIP orders? Second, are you considered in your state essential or critical worker? But please be aware, just because we're critical or essential workers, if there are viable alternatives to in-person contact, just because we can meet in person doesn't mean we should, okay? And if there are out adverse outcomes, we may still be responsible, even having been designated as uh, essential or critical workers. But look carefully at your jurisdiction's rule about whether we are considered such or not and whether there's even been an emergency declared. Many states are beginning to formulate phase-in plans for getting back to what we hope will be something like normal. And be very, very cautious about and thoughtful about what does your state's phase-in plan say. A number of states are saying we're gonna reopen step by step, but if you can do it, continue with remote care. If that's the case, the safer side is to say, okay, the default would be remote care, and is, are there other reasons to, that are really compelling to do this in person? Another issue that's uh, more on the legal side is whether the state is granting immunities to frontline health practitioners, and some states have done that. Um, Illinois, for example, and a number of other states. That can really help reduce the risks of providing care in person Again, a caution for you all about that. You got to look at the immunity language. Uh, the language, I believe, in some states is fairly restrictive and says only those of us treating COVID-19. So if I'm treating somebody having a condition secondary to that, my coverage may not, uh, or my immunity may not exist. And if I'm treating somebody, for example, or assessing them for a pre-existing condition, pre-COVID, I wouldn't be covered at all. So Immunities may exist in some states, but look at them carefully. And they're often on the governor's pages, your licensing board pages, um, also attorney general's office online pages. Another thing that's important to consider is in your community specifically, what are the fatality rates and also the infection rates of COVID? Um, 
low rates aren't a guarantee, but they help to put things in perspective. Be aware that if you're in a, in a community like a number now where the curve has flattened, we're still going to see surges and spikes. So particularly for more vulnerable people, please be aware of who you're working with, who's in your practice, in their families, in your family, your staff, and so forth. And then relatedly, be paying attention to the specifics of your clients or patients' own vulnerability categories, as well as yours, your families, and so forth. In this regard, you do not have to have a, a physician's diagnosis. This is about the standards or categories that CDC and WHO have been putting out there. So for example, uh, if I'm a person who's 65 or older, or, or, um, or I'm a person who's obese or has respiratory uh, difficulties, I'm in a high risk category. If your patients are in those categories, more caution, significant caution is warranted. Um, and then, the, the, the additional point is that it's very important to have the practical capacity to be able to protect your patients and your staff and yourself. And that's along with the, the CDC and WHO lines. Um, can you follow the standards about reducing or trying to prevent transmission? So asking yourself questions, am I able to make sure that patients are gonna wash hands or am I gonna have hand sanitizer? Can you find hand sanitizer in your community and at the local store? Are you gonna require the wearing of masks? Be sure to say no physical contact. Will you be able to do a six foot or more distance? Um, will you have your patients make sure they contact you before coming into your office to tell you whether they've been exposed, they've been in the presence of somebody with COVID, or if they are actually currently showing any symptoms or are ill. Can you rearrange your waiting room, your office, to allow for social distancing? Are you able to go for having people waiting in their cars before they come into your office? Um, will you be able to, to arrange payment, for example, in such a fashion that you don't have to have physical contact or get very close? Um, and are you going to change your 24-hour cancellation policy in addition to things like can you decontaminate between sessions? So as you can see, there are a number of very pragmatic issues that can uh, really affect whether we can go back to in-person. And be sure to document uh, um, each of the, or the policies you're developing about each of these and related issues. And I've just kind of summarized just to give you a sense. Uh, in, and that you've spoken to or informed remotely your patients in advance about the precautions you're going to be requesting them to take. Um, the final step here is going to be making the determination that for a particular patient in a particular situation, uh, in-person services are necessary because other kinds of services are not going to be adequate document that decision and that particular reasoning very carefully. So those would be my basic responses, uh, Liesl, to that question. Mm -hmm. Great, that was, that was great, you got a lot in there. Eric, did you wanna add anything to that? Yes, I would actually, um, when have I not? Um, <laughs> uh, the real issue, it seems to me, it's not so difficult if you're just providing therapy, if that's how you make your living. Um, because you have the option of continuing um, uh, by telepsychology um, and or not. And you can even see some patients, if you're really getting um, what they call Zoom fatigue, uh, you could arrange to see some patients in your office that are not at high risk, if you're not yourself at high risk and your family isn't, um, and then see the people that are high risk, continue to see them um, on telepsychology. But what if you're doing evaluations? Mm -hmm. Evaluations you're doing require testing that cannot be done remotely. Mm -hmm. That's a much harder situation to advise people in because their living depends on their being able to do these evaluations um, and making a decision about whether an evaluation is essential, what the risks and benefits are. So for example, if you're doing a, uh, a special ed evaluation, a neuropsych for special ed, um, the question really is, 
when do you have to have it by? Can you wait? Because the schools aren't going to be open until September. Or do you really need it now so that they can make their decision before September about what they're going to do about it? And what are the consequences to the child versus what are the risks to the family of your having him do it in person? And can you make it as safe as possible, as Dan said, in the office? Um, if I had a neuropsych practice um, that I was doing very well in, I would get one of those uh, thermometer things that they use to check to have, whether people have temperatures. And I'd make everybody who was coming to the office do that. Now, of course, I haven't looked on Amazon to see if you can get that. But there are some people that do this. This, it, it's in some ways, is a much easier thing to comply with if you do therapy and that's what you're doing than is if you do evaluations or other services like forensic evaluations, uh, going into jails, those kinds of things. They become much more complicated and difficult issues. And for those issues, we recommend, again, that you get an individual consult with one of our risk managers um, to help you with your thinking, as well as to colleagues that can help you. Yeah. And Lisa, can I follow up on that? Uh, very quickly. <laughs> OK, very quickly. So just a resource for everybody, the uh, Interorganizational Practice Committee, um, a group of neuropsychologists, has put together some guidance on their website for COVID. And they list a whole bunch of really helpful um, considerations over and above what I've already mentioned. It overlaps to some degree. And that it may help you sort through if your primary work is doing assessment. Um, whether it's wise or unwise to do assessments and whether you can complete some or most of it online. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think one thing too, is we wanna keep in mind, although it is important, I think Eric, to, to take temperatures and things like that to be aware. Certainly if anyone is sick, we don't want, like overtly sick, we don't want them in the office, but it's important to remember that a lot of the literature and research is showing that people can actually be contagious and be completely asymptomatic. So we may have someone who looks fine and seems fine and feels fine, and yet they're spreading the virus. So I think we just want to be really mindful of all the pieces there. The only thing I would say about that is that that's the government standard when somebody's trying to enter the country or when they're making a judgment. That's the way in which the government decides whether this person needs to be quarantined or whether they're safe. To You're absolutely right that they can still be a carrier. Right. Right, so I think what you guys are hearing here is that it is, it's a complex analysis. There's a lot of, a lot of competing issues um, and you know, definitely a lot of careful thought should go into it, clear documentation, informed consent to your clients, um, and then you know, consulting with us or others as well. So I think those are the, the big three things. So I know we've spent a lot of time on those questions because um, you know, I think we're getting a lot of those and so we wanted to go into more detail, but Eric and Dan, I'm going to ask you, we're going to, I'm going to see if we can sort of run through questions a little more quickly now to be sure we can get to more of what's coming in. So we'll start with a question here that says, how does one handle supervision of a student during this time of COVID so that the hours count and we'll, we will fulfill our legal requirements? And Eric, we'll go back to you. Let me run, let me punt that to Dan, who actually was in an academic setting and right. I'll right. So um, the, the two things about this with supervision. One of them is this is going to be very state sensitive. Some states are saying you can do remote supervision and it'll count toward all hours. Other states have not spoken. Other states, uh, to my knowledge, there are a few that are saying, uh, well, you can still stick to the same standard. So you're going to have to check out what your board is requiring. And I realize that some boards are not terribly responsive. They're feeling overwhelmed and also they're working from home if they're open at all. Um, but if your state generally has had uh, a permission, as some of the some states indeed have had for remote supervision, then it's possible to continue. I think the real tough issues here are whether um, an organization or a school or a clinic is saying to the supervisee they must come and do their services in person, and. Um, I've got to say that from my perspective, and I think the team shares this perspective, it's very risky to be requiring people to do in person at this point uh, who are employees or supervisees. And um, there is, there, it, it's fraught. There are employment law implications at a state level. There are also very some pretty significant risk implications as well. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Thank you. All right. Um, Eric, did you want to add anything or maybe we'll just keep going? No. Okay. So this question um, says, okay, I would like to ask our guidelines and recommendations for having telehealth with children with anxiety um, who, and I think this should be, who need to be exposed to talking to other children, like from their classroom and the other child would be in another location. What kinds of informed consent would we need from the parent of the other child? And how about working with another therapist and a child for exposure therapy for children with selective mutism? Eric? Um, well, um, I would certainly agree that you would need to, first thing I would do is I would try to find out, find some colleagues who are doing in vivo work who, some more senior colleagues. I, it's not a kind of work that I'm familiar with, but nonetheless, what I would say is you would clearly need to let the other parent know um, if you were going to have uh, two children um, sharing the treatment, even if one person is only there to be a, a responder to the child that has the problem, and you're trying to, that, that's the identified patient, as it will, or and the other child is a collateral. Um, the parents still need to know, uh, and that also needs to be documented carefully in your notes as to why that was necessary uh, in order to deal with the situation. Most parents, I would think, would not have a problem allowing their kid to do that if they know the family, et cetera. But, um, that would necessarily be what you would do. And the other thing is that you want to make sure that this is a reliable and valid way of doing the kind of treatment you're doing. Um, I would suspect that there isn't a lot of uh, scientific data about the effectiveness of doing um, this by telepsychological means. So if you are going to do it, and there isn't a lot of research on reliability and validity, then you need to add to your own informed consent with the parents of the child who's the identified patient that this is, we just don't know whether this is the same as doing it in person, but in my judgment, given what I know, it's probably better than not doing anything. Um, brief addition, uh, Liesl. I think you might want to take a look at, even though it's for uh, adults, you might want to take a look at our collateral uh, consent form or contract on the trustinsurance.com website. Um, it can be adapted for a parent of a, a minor who might be helping out one of their peers. Um, it would also need, of course, to be adapted to fit a tele mental health uh, context, but it's a good place to start. And it also is, requires you to, to, be, to have all the rules of confidentiality with regard to the other child um, that you would have. Um, I suppose you could argue that, it, that you weren't collecting personal health information about that other child, but my advice would be that they're just, they are just like a collateral and they're doing this uh, in a way that they deserve privacy. Right. I agree. I think we all agree on that, on that point. Great. So um, this gets back to telehealth and uh, interjurisdictional uh, issues. And this is actually a question I get a lot on the consultation line. So I think a lot of people have it. And basically, can you talk a little bit about the interjurisdictional piece if, you, if the provider is licensed and working in the United States, but the patient is temporarily relocated in another country? in this case, Western Europe, but we get the calls a lot for a lot of different countries. I'll answer that very quickly and very succinctly. It is much more dangerous if you are in New York to do tele interjurisdictional practice with someone in New Jersey than it is to do someone in Thailand. <laughs> it's effectively without risk to do stuff across national lines because of the difficulty that any country would have in doing something prosecutorial to you um, in the United States. It would really literally be an international incident. That doesn't mean, again, as I said originally, you still could get a complaint to um, your local licensing board. And it's unclear, one of the problems that they would have in taking jurisdiction is, they say that the transaction takes place where the consumer was, which is in a foreign country. 
but they still might look at what you did. And a lot of times, my, my sense of the risk of that is where you're working with someone who's on a, 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 some kind of college program overseas and the parents are here and the parents have understand what's going on and they want you to provide therapy. But then if there's a real crisis and it, it doesn't turn out well, they might well be people that would want to file a complaint and they would know just where to go. But nonetheless, I don't think that the board would, unless you, unless you did something where when you called me and told me what you did, I would want to say, you did what? You yeah. probably want to be most safe in doing that kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, and yeah, I completely agree. And I think Dan does too. The only other piece I'll add, and this is not about the jurisdictional particular, but you also want to think about the clinical appropriateness for that client and that distance and are there resources for the client in that country or that kind of thing. So, so I, there are two pieces, right? One is the legal interjurisdictional piece, which Eric just addressed pretty clearly, I think. And, but there are other questions that you want to think about if you're going to be overseas, clinical appropriateness, insurance billing, things like that also need to be considered. Are, I would argue, Lisa, these are things, as I said in the first thing, that you should be, that should be documented anytime you do telepsychology with someone who is distant enough so that they can't, they aren't ever coming to your office. Mm -hmm. You need to document exactly why you're doing what you're doing, that you meet all the requirements of the APA telepsych guidelines. In the case of what I call um, adults who are going to, you want to get permission to talk to their parents and you want to make sure that the program they're in has emergency coverage that you can access in the event of an emergency. Right, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next one, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a little long, but it looks like the main question is, you know, for most of us, we transitioned very, very quickly to telehealth services and, um, you know, didn't have a chance to get our current clients or our ongoing clients to sign that informed consent document in advance of doing that. So the, the question is, you know, they got verbal consent from the patient in order to do telehealth, but is it okay to have only verbal consent in the chart and or, um, you know, do they need to go ahead and be getting the written consent as well? Dan, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, always a good idea to get the written consent too. It's fine to document if you had to transition really quickly. You know, Ms. Lee consented to doing telehealth and her behavior is also showing that. So the action confirms it. But getting it in writing, it makes it much harder for somebody to come back and say, oh, you never told me that if um, we were using, you know, a non-HIPAA compliant platform because none, none of the HIPAA compliant ones work and, and DHHS is saying you don't have to now. You never told me that it was risky. So you want to make sure to use the form and um, better late than not at all. Okay. I have a couple of additions. No. Uh, first of all, <laughs> there are lots of ways that they can get you their signature. Yeah. They don't have to actually sign the form. They can sign the form at home and take a picture of it and send the picture to you by email. They can type the they can print the form out, type their name and say this is an electronic signature. Um and that will so um there are many, many ways to uh, solidify with clarity that the person actually has gotten the informed consent and agrees to it. Yeah. But there are some people who really may not be able to do anything other than give you oral consent, and we would not tell you not to do it, but, but you should justify the reasons why you can't get the signature in one way or another should be documented. Right. And yeah, so documentation, right? We keep coming back to that again and again. And worst case, right, you can use snail mail. I mean, we sometimes forget that, but we can. Mm -hmm. So touch your mailbox. Say again? That if you're willing to touch your mailbox. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Um, so the next one uh, is about risk assessment, in essence, via telehealth. So is there any literature on the effectiveness of assessment of suicidal ideation and or dangerous behavior via telehealth, in particular in this case with teenagers? Uh-oh. Uh, Dan, do you want to start? Um, Lisa, could oh, you? Oh, no. I think he looked. Oh, no. There he is. No, I, could you repeat? I, you, I just lost you. You just went out for a moment. And you're still oh, going okay. out. Uh, 
I'm still going out. Hmm. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll say it again. Um, is there any uh, literature on the effectiveness of assessment of suicidal ideation and dangerous behavior via telehealth, in particular regarding teenagers? So um, the issue around assessing high risk of anyone remotely, there are some analogous literatures. There's some information out there, some research about it. Uh, the general it, um, literature on interviewing using remote services suggests that a the closer it gets to being in person like it being you know video chat the more likely it'll be able to be it'll be accurate um, but to my knowledge it's not a large literature and most of what will be you'll, you'll be basing it on for example assessing for suicide is going to be on uh, analogous kinds of situations for example all of you know that it's been uh, it's time honored that there are uh, crisis lines and people in crisis lines will assess for suicide using just phone. Um, it seems to work reasonably well. Uh, and I think, you know, apropos of the risk of assessing risk, if it's between that and not assessing it at all, it seems to me that there's a clear preference you assess. But you also have to be really careful, and I have to be careful as a clinician, that um, if I'm going to assess and it's going to have longer term consequences than calling crisis or trying to get the person you know, in a safe situation. For example, I'm assessing and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing a risk evaluation of whether the person is a sexually violent predator. Those kinds of high um, uh, stakes assessments, I think one has to be very careful about. Uh, even if there's some literature, I don't believe it's extensive and it would need to be in terms of the specifics. Eric, what's your take on it? Well, the first thing I would say is if you're working through telehealth for whatever reason, you may want to use one of the instruments that has been uh, essentially most people use in person, like the Columbia. I can't remember the exact name of the Columbia. Columbia rating scale. On the rating scale, there are several rating scales that you could use, um, and that's a good way of getting uh, data that will uh, will about give you some evaluative ability to determine how likely suicide is, how suicidal somebody is. If you're working with teenagers and you've used that instrument and you realize that there is a risk, more than just a small risk of suicide, because being an adolescent is a risk for suicide at some level. Um, you will be able to make decisions such as, do I require that the parents be able to be contacted and under what circumstances do the parents need to be contacted? Do I have to, in order to see the kid, do I have to actually have a family involvement because it isn't safe to see the kid without that kind of involvement? All those kinds of questions need to be thought about and again, documented. In addition, Eric, the Columbia scale is not, um, has not been, no, no scale after 50, 60 years of research can predict to suicide, as you know. But the Columbia scale is targeted at adults. There are scales that are targeted at kids, you know, teens. And I would encourage you to use ones that are targeted at kids. And I agree with, with Eric's idea of using some structured method. Uh, we still have it being different than we would in person. And I think we do the best we can. Right. And document. <laughs> what I'm saying is, again, from a risk management point of view, having done something like this protects you much more than not having than just using your clinical intuition. Agreed. I. Which one? Do you know one of the names of the uh, adolescent instruments? Oh, there are a number of them. There's one called I think it's the California uh, uh, Suicide Scale for Adolescents. Is one. They often have very similar kinds of um, content to them. And so, but I think a, a, a very quick perusal of the even Googling measures uh, or, or searching um, psych info, you'll find um, some pretty good descriptions. Or you can call the trust and talk yes. to them. and we can right. give you some. Right. right. So this is one you guys have touched a little bit on, but maybe you can um, address more directly and or just offer some uh, resources because it's a, it's a broad question, but can I do psychological testing using a telemedicine platform? Um, so I think Eric has already touched on this to some degree, but I'm gonna take this and then Eric let you follow up. Um, uh, the answer is a cautious yes. 
depending on the nature of the instrument, um, the level of um, knowledge and skill you have in doing any remote kind of service, the practice you have. There are some, for example, neuropsychological testing instruments that have been tested, used remotely and gotten good results. The problem is that there are very few in number. There, there are very few, if any, assessments of, or excuse me, research evaluations of, for example, a waste done remotely. And there are some very clear limitations. So um, it's gonna depend on the kind of testing you do, um, as well as uh, uh, whether, you know, what literature is out there. And uh, there is some, uh, and it's growing. If anything, I think what we're gonna see in, um, in the next five to seven years or 10 years is an explosion of research on the reliability and validities of, uh, of remote service, of remote assessment instruments. Dan, can I ask you, didn't you do a workshop on that? I did, yeah. And, and, people if they're interested on the... Um... So yeah, this was, um, there was a panel of, by the, um, uh, uh, the National Register and the Trust uh, about, I guess it was a week and a half or two weeks ago, um, I believe for trust members and National Register members, it's free. It's uh, four presenters, uh, three of whom are neuropsychologists and myself. And um, there was, they, I think that covered a lot of great territory. And um, I could there go into more detail, but but uh, it's yeah. It, thank you for reminding me. That on the national, that's on the National Register site, right? I believe so. I believe it's on the National Register site. That's right. And I think, do you, do either of you want to comment on sort of the specifics of like, say, for instance, forensic assessment, which may have some, you know, if there's yeah. very high stakes cases, child custody, for instance, yeah. some of the other cases in forensics might be a little different. You know, the, the way I think about this is, is that if I'm on the stand after I've done a remote forensic evaluation of, a, of a, let's say it's a child custody, um, I would, well, even better, if I am the attorney who is opposing you on the stand, and I'm questioning you, I'm gonna be delighted because the first question I'm gonna ask is, Dr. Harris, um, tell me about the reliability and validities of the MMPI uh, as regards remote um, uh, um, uh, test taking. And then of course, you're gonna to have to say, Eric, that there aren't, there's very little on the remote, you know, there is some, by the way, the MMPI is, has been researched more remotely than other instruments. But uh, then I'm gonna go drill down into every single thing you did. And by the end of 15 or 20 minutes, I think the judge is gonna throw your testimony out. So I think uh, unless it's an essential activity to do, uh, unless, as Eric was pointing out, there's something truly crucial at stake and it can't be delayed, um, I wouldn't be doing these kinds of forensic evaluations right now. Preliminary kinds of work, sure. Collateral contact, gathering and reviewing records, doing interviews. You can make a much better argument that those are doable. Eric, what do you think? I, I agree with what you're saying in, around the testing, but I think that it's possible to do a not complete job, but a pretty good job, say in child custody, particularly in child custody where there's high conflict and, and the lack of a decision and the lack of a report is potentially injurious to the kids. Um, you would need to get on the stand and say, if we weren't in the middle of this COVID-19, here's what I would have done that I couldn't do. Here's what I did do. And that means that some of my recommendations will not be as uh, I won't be as confident in them as I would be if I had been able to do everything in person. Um, I think there are also some other kinds of evaluations that you can do, like uh, fitness, uh, to, to competency to stand trial. Um, you know, there are there are ways of doing that that have developed that involve instruments, mostly because the instruments were designed to protect people, the people that are doing the evaluations, have a standardization of them. I would think that a judge mid in, in a situation where you've got somebody who we don't, you don't know whether they're competent and there's a trial scheduled. Um, I think you could do that. And as long as you're willing in the report and in your testimony to talk about what the problems were and the lack of reliability and validity of doing it the way that you did it. But basically I agree with you. If you can avoid it, if it's not urgently needed, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah, which may be the case given that so, depending on where you are, the courts may even be closed, right? Exactly. So they may not even be taking stuff. Exactly. Right? But yeah, so again, the answer is 
it's complex and document and consult. And I, just to, to follow up, uh, Lisa, with that, you know, I've gotten questions in my community uh, about, you know, lawyers really pressuring, for example, for custody evals. And, uh, and then I've suggested that the clinicians, for example, ask, so when is the hearing? And the, and the attorneys come back and say, well, the courts are not in session. We have no idea. Right. So it's like, well, how is this really an emergency? It's not going to change anything. Sure, you can do the initial piece. Right, right. Okay, thanks. I'm going to um, just maybe we can get in a few more questions here. So one question, I understand, excuse me, I understand there is contact tracing that will be initiated soon. For those of us who may end up seeing patients in the office, how would we handle contact tracing requirements and or disclosure of information relative to the confidentiality we offer to our clients? Dan, you want to start? Sure. Two things. One is, um, if your state is aligned with HIPAA, then when there is a mandated report or when even, even uh, under conditions where public health requests information, then they may get it and we may disclose it. We may only give the minimum necessary information. Where the rub is um, in this situation is that, that um, states vary considerably as to the rules they have about whether uh, public health is permitted to get access to, for example, an outpatient psychotherapist information, even minimum necessary. Um, I do think that there's a reasonable justification, just like we've been telling you all along, you know, if we document it, but uh, the, it's going to be very state sensitive and it's going to be important to consult specifically about what are the rules and mandates in your state. Um, and does your own statute uh, or your own case law or statutes in, for example, California or Florida say that um, there is an exception to confidentiality when there is a public health emergency or when there's a, a situation where public health is requiring the reporting of a contagious disease? And we may be, if you have an individual question about a state, we may be able to help you if you call for an individual. Yes. Yeah. You have a database of some of them. Um, and yep. the other thing I would say is if your state does require that, then it will become part of your informed consent under the limits to confidentiality. Um, yep. Because um, you want people, you don't want your clients to feel betrayed. Um, exactly. You have to keep, and one of that brings another question is, you need to monitor your state's public health website. Because mm -hmm. these things change really quickly and when they're issued these kinds of it, 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 one of the things is one of the reasons that it's really important to belong to a state psychological association mm -hmm. because their website will probably have an interpretation of what the state's been doing and keep you informed in a way that will be very hard to do by yourself mm -hmm. yeah that's a great a great resource i do want to um just come also to a question uh so real quick dan it looks like someone is asking for a um Clarification, you stated a resource that started with the interorganizational. Yes, it's called Interorganizational Practice Committee. Interorganizational Practice Committee. It is a group of neuropsychological associations. I think NAN and uh, I believe maybe AAPDN is in on it. Uh, if you search it and you, you'll, you'll find um, a website and some materials. It's, it's AOPC. Great, thank you. So Eric, I'll send this one to you. The question, I have been asked to volunteer to provide support groups for frontline healthcare workers. Is this legal and what are the risks and how can I reduce them? Okay, well, it is legal. If the support group that you're offering, we can say this clearly, is in the state that you're in. And it is legal to do support groups te telepsychologically. Um, whether or not, but when you're doing things as a volunteer, that doesn't mean the rules that apply to your regular practice don't necessarily apply to the work that you're doing. There are a number of laws which give immunity to volunteers, but we have not been able to definitively, they're complicated, and we have not been able to definitively determine that um, there is immunity for doing volunteer activities with I would assume with mostly with first responders or healthcare providers. I have done, I have advised one group in Vermont that was doing it and they have instituted and they seem to have a pretty good idea. And one of the things I advise them, while the same standards will apply to the work, 
to not, it's not a good idea to do therapy, or at least it's, if you're going to do a group support, you should say, this isn't therapy or a substitute for therapy. My job is not to be your therapist, but to be the mediator of this group to help you all talk about what's been going on and to provide you with some structure for how you can have those kinds of conversations in a way that we know will be helpful based on the knowledge that we have. Um, if you're going to do, because really when you're doing a support group, you're not doing therapy. It's not psychotherapy. Um, if you want to do volunteer to do psychotherapy, that's fine too. But that, I would not treat that any differently than I would treat doing therapy with somebody who was paying for it. I think the same standards will apply. Although I will say it's hard to imagine a licensing board um, coming after a volunteer that does a decent job. But, and in it, are the data that we have from, uh, say, Katrina indicates that doing that kind of work is almost without risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Maybe we can fit in one or two more here, hopefully. One question, if I need to report child abuse and my patient is in another state, where do I report? Dan, you want to start with that? Yeah, so what we generally recommend is you report it in your state. Uh, and the reason is that, let's say I'm a practitioner in Wisconsin and I'm licensed there. I am under the Wisconsin jurisdiction. I am bound to obey my laws in, in Wisconsin but not necessarily in Texas. They don't have any jurisdiction over me. So what we would like for you all to have is the, the protection of your immunity standards within your own state, even if your local Child Protective Services or Department of Child and Family Services says, um, well, no, you report it. What we would advise is you follow up, report it to your own jurisdiction and let them forward it because they've got the immunity, okay? Great. All right, uh, next question. And this is sort of the reverse stand of what you, got, what you were talking about earlier that uh, the author says here, it seems that social distancing will be recommended for many months to come. So I am considering giving up my physical office space and continuing with only offering telehealth services. What risk factors should I be considering? Well, Eric? Eric. Um, I don't think that there's any risk factors. It's the same as doing therapy. I think the risk factors are really, um, we're discovering some things about doing uh, work by teletherapy exclusively um, as to the number of patients in a day and how exhausting it is and uh, mm -hmm. the fact that the video is not as good as people were advertising it as being. So there are some people that are saying, I need to get back to doing this face-to-face uh, -face as soon as I can because I feel personally that I did much better work face to face. Mm -hmm. But from a legal standpoint, um, there is no, we, most states have said that uh, telepsychology is the same as psychology in person. And that's what the APA guidelines say as well. Great. Thank you. And this will be our final question. And Dan, I'll send it to you first. What kind of plan should I have in place in the event a patient becomes suicidal during a telepsychology session? Um, so the plans should be very similar to the kind of plan that you have when you see them in person. Um, very important to have a collaborative safety plan put together beforehand if you've got somebody who you know uh, has suicidal ideation or has risk factors. If you don't, um, making sure that you know where they are physically every time you have a clinical contact with them is critically important. And then you're going to probably call in your community, either 911 or crisis, um, if you're doing remote services and the person is, you know, across the state or across state lines, the duty is yours, it's mine as a professional to know the resources there and to be able to contact them immediately. Great. And I would only add to that, that the, it's important to remember that the telepsych guidelines say having an emergency crisis plan is an essential part of doing telepsychology. So you would need to have a contact if you were working with someone across state lines. Th that would be a part of what you would do regardless of whether somebody's suicidal or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having that plan in advance before oh, yeah. they become suicidal, that's the key. So, okay, we are right at our time. 
Thank you both to Dan and Eric. You guys, that was, was great to, to, I think you gave great questions and we managed to get through a lot of them today. Um, before we go, I just want to say stay tuned. Uh, for those of you who are looking to get CEs for this, Dr. Martin's going to come back on in just one quick moment to give you all the details about that. We hope this was helpful and we'll see you uh, on next week on the 7th. Thank you, Liesl. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that. That was very stimulating. I appreciate your help and uh, we got some good feedback. So now, the CE credit. Uh, you see on the slide before you where what the steps are. I'm going to go over it. There is a link. You can click on it or you can copy and paste it and put it in your browser. You'll be prompted to enter your CE account username and password. Now, this is not the same as a password you might have had with Beacon Live. It's not the same if you're a policyholder who has used the online service center. Uh, rather, it is a new account. And if you ha haven't opened one, you can do that right now. Um, if you have to reset your password because you don't remember it, uh, then just check your a spam filter for the reset email. It could go there instead of directly into your email. After you've logged in, select the take exam button. You need to get a score of 75% or higher to pass. You may leave this exam and resume it later. Log into your CE account page and look under my continuing education to resume the exam. When you're done with the exam, you'll be prompted to fill out an evaluation. Once the evaluation is complete, you'll be redirected to a page where you can download your certificate and view your answers. You can also look in the chat box now for that link. You'll earn one CE from this event and it can be combined with other risk management credits, as we said, to work towards a 15% discount. So again, follow the link, it's in the chat box, You'll be prompted to enter your CE account username and password. If you don't have an account, create one. And then select take exam. And then after that, when you're done, you'll be prompted to fill out an evaluation. Then you'll be redirected to a page where you can download your certificate. Thank you so much. And be sure to join us for our next telepsychology chat with Drs. Sarah Smucker Barnwell and Dr. Margot Adams Larson. And then our next roundtable following that. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Take care. Bye bye.